Hello uh, and welcome to What Does It Take? How Women Rise in Our Overseas and Home Offices. Please let us know where you're tuning in from in the chat area. Also, uh, while we wait uh, for a few more people to join, uh, please take a moment, look around uh, and grab a pen and a piece of paper. We will be doing something uh, fun with those later in the session. Welcome. I'm Lisa Tarantino. I'm with APT Associates, and I am thrilled to be joined today by uh, Carrie Ann Gaia, an associate with APT Associates, with uh, Kelly Saldana, the director of the Office of Health Systems for USAID, and by Dr. Linda Sharkey, uh, an author and also global advisory board member of the Best uh, Practices Institute. We've been hearing this week uh, that the global development uh, sector is offering and our, and our organizations are increasingly promoting women leaders and offering us more opportunities uh, overseas and in our home offices. But let's be honest, leading an organization and getting to leadership position in the multicultural environments where we work can be challenging. And these challenges are compounded for women. This section is going to give participants an opportunity to learn uh, lessons learned from leaders at all levels. Uh, uh, leadership skills for women in trans-global environments and suggestions on how to adapt our leadership styles uh, to different contexts with integrity. In this context, I'm going to talk about something that I haven't heard anyone else uh, speak about yet in this forum, uh, and that is multicultural awareness and the knowledge and skills uh, to navigate as a leader in those environments. This isn't a topic that's taught in, uh, in master's programs in economics or agricultural um, uh, development. Rather, we learn this from experience, generally, from talking with other women and from events like this. In my 25 years of experience as a leader in all, at all levels, um, in uh, over 20 countries in Southeast Asia, Africa, Central and Eastern Europe and Latin America uh, in the Caribbean. I've had experiences um, starting with my very first job out of grad school at age 26 with the title of vice president in the business and banking culture of Uzbekistan. Um, I've, I've learned to uh, co um, hone my skills of walking into a new cultural environment and calibrating my leadership style uh, to maximize effectiveness. In the last few years, I've done a bit of research um, and I've interviewed more than a dozen women uh, with between 15 and 30 years of experience in global development, ranging from a Nigerian technical director of a USAID health uh, program in Nigeria to an African-American uh, woman in development finance and a, a white senior manager at a global development consulting firm. From those interviews, my research, my own experience, I've distilled a few unique challenges that women face as, as leaders uh, in multicultural environments, uh, some uh, effective strategies they found for overcoming those challenges and for being effective. And I found a few things that were surprising and I'm gonna share them quickly. So the unique challenges, I think one is the, is the obvious, as we heard from our keynote speaker, Pat Mitchell, uh, just yesterday, sexism, racism, and discrimination exist in every culture in the world. Uh, they just show up differently. We have small peer groups. Um, we've also heard about this. Uh, it inhibits our ability to network and learn from others. Most chiefs of party, have we heard, are men. Um, and although things are changing, there are still far fewer women at the top of our industry than men. Women's leadership styles. The research show that women tend to be more inclusive and collaborative as leaders, and that's a strength. But those qualities can exacerbate situations where um, it's not, there isn't a natural authority conveyed to women. 
Uh, and this can be confusing and seen as a sign of weakness in some cultures. So what are some strategies women employ to maximize their effectiveness in multicultural environments? There's six. Number one, and I think this one's the most important, is take time to learn how things are done in another uh, culture and environment, especially communication. This is time well spent. Start slowly, observe, don't try to uh, get the staff to like you, um, criti critically examine your, your uh, assumptions. One quick painful story uh, from my research was of a, a South Asian professional who moved to a Southeast Asian country as a chief of party. In her first week on the job, she was 10 minutes late. There was traffic uh, to meet a high ranking government official. What she didn't know is that in that culture, to be late, even to be on time and not early, was a sign of extreme disrespect. Uh, and her relationships uh, never really recovered from that. Number two, your job, your education, your abilities, they come first. Don't be afraid to assert them. Most authority comes from what you assume. You don't have to be cult overly culturally sensitive um, because at some point you need to make sure your job gets done. Number three, uh, relationships matter. Um, be careful that your are, sometimes I think we all have a tendency to overperform. Um, and while doing that, we can keep our heads down and maybe not take the time that's needed to establish relationships. Get to know your staff, where you can delegate, how you can promote within. It'll make a better team and less work for you. Um, but you will never notice that unless you take the time to get to know your staff. Uh, be emotionally present. Um, while being mindful of tone and timing, it's important to be yourself. That's one of the intangible leadership traits uh, that will earn you respect. A common strategy I found was to start relationships with new teams and colleagues with strength uh, before uh, opening up with warmth and humor. And this is uh, a strategy women sometimes take to to overcome any potential exacerbating um, uh, situations with cultural challenges of, of being too collaborative, et cetera. And then lastly, number six is to seek mentors and other forms of professional help. Um, and I'm, I won't get into that. I know we've heard a lot about that already this, this, in this forum. So the surprising things, the most surprising finding that I, I, I I came upon was that gender-based barriers to leadership can sometimes be more acute in your home culture uh, than outside of it. One of my favorite quotes uh, from the interviews was of a, a petite uh, blonde uh, professional I work with. Um, and when I asked her what it was like to be 27 and leading a team in Burundi, was it hard? And she said, Lisa, I was a Martian. I was so different from everybody else. The rules did not apply to me. I didn't have to follow the same rules uh, that my, my female Burundian colleagues did. And that was very freeing. One of the women I interviewed, an African-American, had a really positive experience working in development uh, in Africa. She said she had a great experience as a black woman. She was well received and it seemed that there was a, a strength in uh, seeing among our colleagues seeing familiarity uh, in the development person uh, in their program. The surprising part was when she went back to the home office, she found that her voice as a, as a woman and especially a woman of color felt lesser and she had the most challenges when she came back uh, to the United States. So another, the last, I'm gonna close with my last surprise and, um, and it's something that, that I feel myself as well, is that it can be a fantastic thing to be a woman in a multicultural environment. Both doors are open to us, the traditional man's world and the traditional woman's world. I've been brought into kitchens, been able to talk about children. Uh, I've been treated with respect while also protected. Uh, you're the boss, uh, but you're also the mom or the little sister. And that can uh, bring a warmth uh, that can bridge cultures. That might not be 
the the stance of every every woman, every professional woman. Um, but it's it's something that I personally enjoy. Um, I I love it. So, on that note, I'm going to introduce you to my fantastic colleague. Carrie Ann Gaia, she's an associate with Apt Associates. She's a results-driven leader uh, with expertise in uh, project and organizational management and environmental client, uh, compliance. She uh, has a master's degree um, in forensic science and a specialization in molecular biology. Uh, she was originally, she was formerly in our office in Jamaica and just recently moved to the home office uh, in the United States this year. Carrie Ann. Thank you so much, Lisa. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. I am Carrie Ann, as Lisa mentioned earlier. I was born and raised on the small island of Jamaica. To give some context to those who may not be familiar with Jamaica, it is situated in the Caribbean south of Cuba, tiny dot on the world map. In fact, it is 895 times smaller in size than the US. I love my little island and it would be remiss of me to not teach you some Jamaican phrases while taking you through my personal journey from the field office to the home office. So in a snapshot, I've held many positions throughout my career in occupational and environmental health and safety. I've been in the public sector, the private sector, served as technical consultant, been on the side of the client as well as that of the contractor. And I've certainly benefited greatly from the diverse experiences garnered along the way. But my journey to this point has not come without its challenges and navigating through them took strategy. It took perseverance and patience, which brings me to my first Jamaican proverb. Donkey say, the world no level, meaning disparity exists in society. There is no level playing field for everyone. You see, I resided in a third world and developing nation that faces persistent struggles due to slow economic growth, high public debt, corruption, cronyism, and nepotism. Job opportunities, especially at the technical and management level, were sparse to say the least. But on top of it all, I pursued studies that were a little bit unconventional. Experimental biology, forensic science with a specialization in molecular biology, occupational health and safety. So job postings in my field were far and few. And when an opportunity did come along, I had to grapple with the fact that there was a 70% chance I may not be able to attain it because I did not have a direct link to someone with influencing power in that organization. The textbook concept that education is the key is glorious and noble, but having that key is not always guaranteed that that door would be unlocked. In many instances, education takes second place to connections or who you know, a phenomenon that is very much a reality in Jamaica. You see, nepotism is not new. Favoritism is a part of life. But oftentimes, qualified individuals like myself are pushed to the back of the line because, quite frankly, we have little or no connections. Second Jamaican proverb, and I hope you remember them. Little but talawa, meaning small but strong. So I was a young professional who looked like a very young professional. Yes, I couldn't hide it. Standing at four feet, 11 inches tall, just about 100 pounds. So much to offer if only persons would take me seriously and not look at me as if I was a child. I was constantly wearing five inch heels, constantly dressing in suits, and still being told that I was the perfect height for an armrest. The struggles, right? A few years ago, I led the design and implementation of a capacity building training with the Minister of Health in Jamaica. And in the preparations phase, my communications were through emails and phone calls, never 
face-to-face -face interactions. On the day of the event, a key point of contact for the ministry went to my colleague, which is a more mature lady, introduced himself and addressed her as Carrie Ann. After she clarified that she was not Carrie Ann and directed in my way, he continued to say that based on how I handled myself over the phone and through emails, he was expecting someone much older. You see, in Jamaica, leadership or senior management roles are usually reserved for the older, wiser individuals. That good old rite of passage, work your way through the system and up the ladder requires time, is often what's said, and especially in the public sector. Years of service seems to take first priority in consideration for any post. And the truth is, is there a perfect age at which an individual can effectively assume a leadership role in an industry? It's impossible, I believe, to pinpoint the age at which someone can perform best in a given role. In fact, research has shown that natural born leaders tend to exhibit leadership abilities from an early age. Yet this bias exists and the culture of small developing nations seems to foster the growth of this practice. I'll give you another personal story. As field operations manager back then, I managed a team with close to 200 field workers across Jamaica. 65% of them were between the ages of 18 to 24. A young leader leading young people came with unique challenges I never envisioned. One, they were not confident I had the authority to lead them. Two, I was not experienced enough to give accurate and appropriate direction. Three, a position in operations and compliance was usually held by a male. So I clearly was not fitting the stereotype. Another silent issue I faced was the institutional bias towards persons from developing countries. This presumption that our experience and your education is less valuable than those from the developed world. Employees in my very own country will always defer to someone from an international forum than to consider a local, highly qualified young professional. I cannot tell you how many times I've applied for roles with regional or international assignments only for my CV to be scrutinized, questioned, and undervalued because it was from a small third world nation. Are my degrees from my local university acceptable? Are my years of local work experience sufficient to meet the international role? I mean, I certainly possess the knowledge, skill sets, ability, and potential to contribute to global development programs. As I hailed from a developing country, and therefore would have first-hand knowledge of the issues to be in a position to make transformational leadership decisions. I know I resonate with some when I say ethnocentrism is a real issue for both men and women, but it is particularly difficult for women. Gaps in CV due to childbirth, child rearing, caring for the sick and elderly, personal medical or health issues, or even the glaring issue of job market constraints are often probed. All things said, it was really difficult for me to gain that out of country experience, which was something I truly longed for. I use this analogy a lot. A lot. I'm a small person, well, literally, but also hailing from a small country in a crowded room, searching for a ladder to elevate myself. A lot of strategies to navigate your career as a woman are being discussed this week. And not to be repetitive, I've certainly utilized a lot of them. But some that were most impactful for me was, as Lisa, Lisa mentioned earlier, finding a mentor that aligned with the goal and vision for my life. I was fortunate to have a chief of party who believed in my capabilities and used my idiosyncrasies to highlight my strengths. 
having someone to guide and motivate you is something that's treasured and not at all common. Another thing I did was find a company to work with that was not all talk and no action. It's important for me to highlight that before applying for a position at Apt Associates, I researched their mission, their values, their reputation. I wanted to know about their hiring protocols, their stance on diversity, gender equality, and social inclusion, and how that aligned with my personal views. For the first time, I really thought, I really believe I'm representing an entity that rewarded my hard work. Well, not only with more challenging work, but gave me opportunities that nurtured my abilities. And I think that's something for you to look for in a future employer. Lastly, is staying true to your principles, values, and ethics. Sometimes in a zeal to navigate the challenges, elevate yourself, and gain, gain global experience, your ethics can sometimes become bendable. A writer, Amy Anderson, says, success will come and go, but integrity is forever. Hold steadfast to your morals and character. I'll leave you with one final Jamaican proverb, and it's one, one cocoa, full basket. And that simply means persevere until you reach your goal. Use every stumbling block as an opportunity to make yourself better. You see, no doubt my steadfast commitment to performing above and beyond the call of duty has been recognized. And I truly hope it will for you too. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you so much, Carrie Ann. That was fantastic. I could see a lot of people uh, on this call could relate to those experiences. Um, we have some, we'll, we'll get to questions uh, towards the end, um, but first I'd like to introduce Kelly Saldana, the Director of Office of Health Systems at USAID. She is the, um, she began her career as a health system strengthening advisor in the Bureau for Latin America and the Caribbean. She has spent several years as the Deputy Director of the Office of Health, Infectious Diseases and Nutrition at USAID. And her career has also included supporting a wide array of development programs, including the Haiti earthquake response, implementing the inaugural round of the Saving Lives at Birth Grand Challenge, and leading the development of USAID Zika response. She has a master's degree in public health and public and international affairs from the University of Pittsburgh. Kelly. Thanks, Lisa, and good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Um, so USAID, as I'm sure you are aware, is a large organization that works across all sectors of development. The organization is made up of headquarters staff, field staff, including both American and local staff, as well as foreign service officers, civil service officers, and contractors. The people who work with USAID, including staff and implementing partners, come from very diverse backgrounds from across, across the globe and across professions. All of these factors, I think, make it the very definition of a multicultural environment. Not only does the organization's culture change and adapt to the different countries we work in and the different backgrounds of the staff, but there are different cultures across development sectors, employment categories, and job functions. As a woman working in the health sector at headquarters in the US, the challenges I face are different from those of female colleagues like Carrie Ann or other colleagues who are working in more traditionally male dominated sectors or in countries with less women's empowerment. However, I think there are some common opportunities in the sector that directly or indirectly impact our voice as women and our ability to get things done. Over the years, I've developed some specific strategies to leverage these opportunities, and that's what I wanna focus on today. Regardless of the different challenges we face, women are well positioned to leverage the opportunities inherent in the development sector. Just looking at the number of women working in public health and in global development suggests there's something about these sectors which align to these distinct advantages that women have. In my work, I seek to leverage these natural advantages by combining them with management and leadership strategies, 
which aren't women only strategies, but strategies that I've used to shape my skills as a woman in a leadership position. I'll provide two key examples. First, as mentioned by Lisa and others, collaboration is a key ethos of development. Whether it takes the shape of community and stakeholder involvement, the push for public-private partnerships, or even in the government, the whole of government approach. To offer generalization, development works best when there's robust collaboration and women often seek to collaborate. Women are great at working in groups and on teams. This is a strength of women who work in the development sector, both in terms of promoting the technical nature of our work, but also for working in the environment of different organizations. Collaboration itself can take many forms. Some of the most effective ways in which I collaborate within USAID are not in large meetings, which can be dominated by a few voices, but through informal networks. I will often work behind the scenes before a meeting and have one-on-one -on -one conversations with key stakeholders to get their ideas and incorporate them into my work so they're more likely to support my work later or at that meeting stage. I'll even put out draft documents that are wholly incomplete and include mostly a rough outline of my ideas, but I send them out for comments so I can ensure that I can adapt and weave in others' viewpoints in the final draft, which also helps to build collaboration in final stages. Another way in which work and development in general, and the health sector in particular, aligns to the strengths of women is an understanding that programs themselves and individuals change over time and need to adjust to new circumstances in order to continue to perform well. My feeling has always been that as long as I'm personally operating within the same principles that I'm espousing as a development professional, there's very little room within the hierarchy of the organization to deny me the opportunities I seek. My personal experience has informed my management style and approach. I recognize that people have a variety of skills that they can and will offer if they're given the right supportive environment. I also recognize that people have complicated lives with competing priorities. I've been at USAID for 17 years. I had both my children while working at USAID. I've never missed a birthday. I've attended most school events. And for years, I was the primary pickup parent, which often meant I needed to leave the office by 445 in order to ensure I would get to daycare before they started charging by the minute. In adapting to these priorities of mine in my personal life, I don't think I ever once asked for permission to leave early or to schedule a TDY for different dates or to take time off in the middle of the day. I would mostly inform my supervisors that that is what I was going to do and why. But at the same time, I also made sure that I never used my family as an excuse for not getting my work done. I adapted and adjusted my schedule. Sometimes I worked evenings to make up for leaving early, or I would leave extra early to ensure I could pick up my kids, get them home, and get them settled before calling into that last meeting of the day. Shortly after my first daughter was born, I was the first person in the Latin American Caribbean Bureau to take a regularly scheduled telework day. I know that, that in this day and age, uh, it's hard to believe that we ever really needed to make the case for telework. But at the time, managers in the Bureau believed that employees who were teleworking weren't working and that they were really just on vacation. I told the Bureau leadership that if they ever needed me to come in on a telework day that I would, and if they ever felt that I wasn't responsive on something during a telework day, that they could end the whole telework experiment. And then I made sure never to give them a reason to end that experiment. These examples provide an important lesson that I think is critical to navigating the challenges and leveraging opportunities in a multicultural environment. And that is to try not to operate in the context of the way things are, but in the way that, in the context of the way things should be. I think this also reflects key principles of global development. As a field, we're constantly working towards ambitious and potentially idealistic goals. One, hopefully not too idealistic goal across development sectors is to promote women as leaders. If we're working towards a world where women are seen as strong and equal leaders and are given equal opportunities, 
We should be building this into not only the objective of our, of our development work, but the ways in which we do that work. In that respect, I try to empower young professionals by providing them with the right opportunities for development and learning, giving them the flexibility to adapt to their lifestyles and leading by example. When I travel or work with colleagues in other countries, I'm sensitive to the fact that the role of women in those countries may be different than it is in the US or that my role as a leader at USAID may be more unique in the context in which I'm traveling. Sometimes I will change the way I act to respect local cultures regarding the appropriate dress or other norms like showing up on time. <laughs> but I continue to model the same approach to leadership that I would in, U in the US. Within USAID, such leading by example carries over into our development work, encouraging partners and implementers to create leadership positions for women is one way that USAID project managers align how we work with our development objectives. So in summary, the tools I've used most effectively to navigate across the multicultural environment that is working in USAID and working in global health and development are one, to leverage my experience and technical skills through informal networks and relationships to build trust and collaboration on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Two, to hold myself to high standards that align to the standards we aim to achieve within the development sector. And three, to be open and transparent about who I am and my role without feeling I need to adjust to meet others' expectations. So um, thank you all, and I turn it back over to Lisa. Thanks so much, Kelly. I think I learned something just now. Um, and I And I think, I, I've heard you say that this, this, this talk before, but um, uh, I, I feel like there's just a lot there that, to, to take away. So thanks again. Uh, next, I will introduce Dr. Linda Sharkey, um, a Global Advisory Board member of the Best Practice Institute. Uh, Dr. Sharkey has deep experience working with Fortune 500 companies and has, sell, has held senior human resource executive positions at Hewlett Packard and at GE Capital. She is the author of a number of books on workforce development and leadership, including Winning with Trans Global Leadership. She is a keynote speaker at many global events and a renowned, uh, re renowned Marshall Goldsmith leadership coach and thought leader. Welcome, Linda. Thank you so much, Lisa. I, I tell you, in listening to the stories of, the, of yourself and the two other panelists, it's, it's really inspiring because I've done a lot of research on what it took to be and what it takes to be what we call a trans-global leader. And all three of you embody the principles which we've, we researched and found to really make a difference in people and women who are trying to, and who are placed in global leadership roles. Now, why did we do this research? And, and as you mentioned, I have a book with other co-authors um, called Winning with Transglobal Leadership. And we did that primarily because, you know, I worked in two major companies and I also worked in the private se uh, public sector and private nonprofit where we would take people and we would put them on global assignments. And some people spiraled up and really did great, no matter where they were in the world, which is why we called them trans-global leaders. And others who were very successful in their local environment could not expand in a way that made them successful when they went outside. And you may know, and you probably do some of this in your own organizations, but uh, most big companies do what they call a talent review or talent assessment. And very often, and a number of you spoke of this, the bias is to go with that male who, uh, you know, they all trust and know and who gets considered as, you know, like the top talent and, you know, is very successful in the projects that they're doing in the home country and putting them in a big global assignment. Well, these assignments cost a ton of money for any organization. And picking somebody just because they're great in their local environment did not seem to be the best strategy in a lot of cases. So 
we embarked on really sitting down and looking at over 200 global leaders who were deemed successful. Of that population, 30 some percent were female executives. Now, unfortunately, it was only 33% because as we all know, and you've all cited, um, as you get closer to the top of the uh, top of the food chain, there are less women in those roles. And I think that's beginning to change because people are realizing, which I will go into, that many of those traits of, gr of great trans global leaders are traits that are held by men for sure, but are held by women. And so we sat down and interviewed these people from companies that were listed, that listed these people and organizations that listed these people as their top global talent. We, we tried to decide what it is that they did. Now we used a, a behavioral researcher who's very well known in understanding organizational culture, one of our co-authors, Dr. Rob Cook, uh, to help design the research because we wanted it to be uh, valid and reliable. We then said, well, here's the other important factor. It may be great to be collaborative and it may be great to do, but is that really driving effectiveness of the organization? So we had a database of 100,000 leaders from around the world who we knew drove highly effective organizations on four, four levels. They had great talent working for them, they performed at a very high organizational level, meeting their goals, et cetera. Um, and they had the leadership characteristics that um, seemed to be directly correlated to that. So we took our research of these uh, 200 global leaders that we were looking at, and we compared them against this 100,000 person database that drove really effective organizational cultures. And I will tell you, organizational culture every time will trump country culture. If you hail from a certain part of the world or a certain company or organization that's from a certain part of the world, the culture of that organization is going to affect how you interact and what you do, much more so than the local culture within which you are working. So it was a very important distinction here. And it's a very important global leadership trait. So as a result, we were able to uncover statistically and correlate five critical behaviors, which the three of you frankly demonstrated beautifully in your stories of what a real, what we call trans global leader is. And the reason we said trans global leader is the following. The age of multiculturalism is over. <coughs> Many organizations are multicultural. Transglobal is where you have someone that can morph and go anywhere in the world and be effective. They know how to be effective, <coughs> excuse me. And that's why we use that term. So if you pull up the matrix, I'm gonna share the five characteristics with you. I know that this is an eye chart and uh, sorry about that. This is actually what we came, uh, what we discovered in the book. I mean, in our research, <coughs> excuse me, across the top line are the key characteristics that we found of trans global leaders. Every one of our trans global leaders demonstrated these characteristics to higher or lesser degrees. They tended to be, of all the population that we looked at, they tended to be uh, higher in these particular areas. The interesting one which I will talk about, is this one on uh, sort of values and integrity, ethics. And uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. That was not a mixed bag because they are absolutely, like uh, Carrie Ann said, they are true to their values, their ethics and their integrity and they understand what that is. But they will also not necessarily make judgment about uh, other people's values that may look different in another country from what yours are. They uh, tend to be open and accepting of that. Obviously they're not doing anything that's gonna be corrupt or, or any of that kind of thing, but they're, they're going to be non-judgmental about how um, uh, time may operate within an, within an organization. And I think the story that you told, I think it was you Lisa that said, 
you know, this woman was 10 minutes late and she was never able to get over that. We have examples where people came in and, you know, told some interesting jokes. I don't mean off color jokes, but we're, we're not clear. And they were never able to get over that. We have other examples where people came in and they couldn't accept the fact that in certain parts of the world, people are talking all the time and they're not necessarily listening to the presentations the way this individual was used to and expected. And as a result, totally rejected in that area. So it's, it's a very, it's, a, it's a, a, an interesting one. But let me go through the uh, characteristics with you quickly here. What we call uncertainty resilience. This is where people are really able to make sense out of chaos. They're not, um, they don't need all the information and all the facts where some people do, but they're able to see the big picture, the forest um, for the trees. And they're, they help people that are working with them and for them really understand that big picture, that larger purpose, and they're able to connect the dots to that. Um, and that's a very, very important characteristic. Um, they also um, not, don't necessarily need very stable working environments. And I think um, you, Kelly, talked about, you know, that the environment is always changing. And you've got to adjust to those facts. So let me say down the side here are some, um, uh, some things to look at to determine whether someone has these various characteristics of a transglobal leader. And that's what I'm going to go through. They're really all about change. Um, they're strategic in their vision. We heard the three other speakers talk about strategy. Um, they very rarely will put people or things uh, in boxes. So therefore, they're much more open to diversity. Um, in fact, they seek that out. Um, <laughs> you know, I always tell this story, and, and you guys probably um, may or may not identify with this, but you know, when we would send people to other countries, um, you, you could always tell if somebody wanted to live in the expat community, send their kids to the German school if they were German or the American school if they were American, join the respective country club from, from which they hailed. These people are not going to assimilate themselves into the local culture. These people are not going to be transglobal leaders because they reject the local culture. They're trying to, they're rejecting the diversity and the um, beauty of living in a different environment. So that's something to really look for. Um, their leadership strength is they create meaning out of amb ambiguity, and it's a very important trait. And we've done other research which highlights that fact. And the team connectivity is another really big one. And I think uh, you, Kelly, talked about you know collaboration across different cultures and how important that is. When we say team connectivity, we mean you know, connecting across boundaries. In other words, these people do not need to have a direct control over massive amounts of hierarchy. In fact, they tend to reject that. And what they tend to do is understand the, the beauty of the diversity that exists. And they pull together teams of people who uh, may look, act, interact differently to get a broader perspective on things. Um, so they, they will support those teams. You know, they will remove barriers so that the teams can do what they need to do to work together. They're highly supportive of diversity. Um, they don't, and many of you probably have had bosses, I know I certainly have both in the public and the private se sector, that seem, see teams um, as being there to help them look good and help them be better at what they're doing. That tends to be across male and female lines, by the way, and I'm sure you can think of a couple on, of both genders. These people, meaning transglobal leaders, are really all about making whatever the team is or whoever working for them or with them on a particular project, making them much more successful. It's not about the leader, it's about the people that are working with them and what they're trying to accomplish. Um, they act based on the needs of others and the organization, not based on their own needs. This next one, pragmatic flexibility, adapting to cultures. This is where the whole personal values situation that comes into play uh, that, that was talked about. 
and they emphasize the needs of the local organizations more so than what they may understand and experience. And I'll give you a really great example. We had this guy from China who was working for Procter and Gamble, and you know, I happened to do a lot of work with them in China. And um, one of the things that he discovered is that he would be going to a country like, let's say, Japan, and you know, trying to take a process or practice that worked in the US in this particular case and plumping it on Japan or on China uh, or Uzbekistan. And people resented that. They recoiled, they pulled back, they didn't want to do it. Immediately, the US bias was, oh, they don't like the US, they don't want to do it, you know, they 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 you know really don't understand, they're not smart enough, whatever. And what he finally realized is he would go to a place and say, here's what we need to accomplish. Here's what we're trying to do. How would we do that here? And was able to say, okay, well, this is the process they use. May not be our process or the process that they use in Germany, but this is the process that they use here. And we're able to get to an end result which is exactly the same end result. It was so powerful. It was so powerful because he sought first to understand the culture and what was going on, as opposed to imposing what needed to happen. It was so powerful that Procter and Gamble put together these SWAT key teams that would go all over the world as they were trying to introduce new concepts and new ideas. And it became really effective. They come across as tolerant, and I want to underscore that because some parts of an organization that you may work for may think that if you're really a trans-global leader, you're too tolerant of other perspectives and other views. But from what we could see, the more tolerant, again, not being unethical and not, um, not being unethical, but the more tolerant, more accepting, the more open you were, the more you were able to understand your personal biases, which is so important, Carrie, and you talked about bias, and it is, it drives everything. It drives everybody's perspective of diversity and multiculturalism. And, you know, being able to understand that and be in tune with what yours are so that you can overcome those is really essential. Perceptive responsiveness, and this is a great one, and we saw this all the time, both in the public and private sector. Somebody would walk in, a leader would walk into a new assignment and they'd give an instruction, direction, male or female, and assume that everybody understood it and everybody would walk away and um, get it done tomorrow. And that's not how things work. And particularly, you know, I, I'm sure uh, those of you that may, who may have worked in India, you know, there's a, a, a body language that the Indians have, which many um, interpret to be accepting of what's being said. That's not the case. And I, I just happened to highlight India in that, that particular circumstance, but there are many indicators of that. A really great trans-global leader will go in and help people understand what it is that they're trying to do or need to do. They will ask questions. They will probe. They will answer. They will give effective feedback. They will accept negative feedback. And I think one of you talked about that. They will accept negative feedback as an opportunity to change and do something different to uh, enable the changing customer base in which they are working. Um, and that's very, very important. And the final piece here is the talent orientation. Um, Lisa talked about this beautifully. They will know their talent. They know who is working with them. They know the great women that are out there. Carrie Ann, somebody who is a higher up than you, who is a really great uh, trans-global leader, would know that you are a four foot level, uh, uh, 11 powerhouse and be keeping an eye on you and making sure that your career advanced. And really great trans-global leaders are all about their talent, their people. They go into another area, region, at whatever. They learn who the talent is. And one of the things that they do day one 
when they set foot in is begin to develop the local talent for potential succession so that they can leave and ultimately go somewhere else. So they're very interesting uh, bunch of pe people. So I'd like to go to the next slide because we did send this out. Now, I, I just wanna highlight that I'm giving you a truncated version. All of this is, is in the book. Um, it's not an advertisement for the book, but all of this is in the book. And, uh, you know, we go through very detailed strategies. How do you interview for transglobal leadership? How do you assess for transglobal leadership? How do you develop for it, et cetera? And I'm, gonna, I'm sharing with you the highlights here. Here is a mini survey of the 72 questions that we ultimately developed and we ultimately validated and correlated to effective results-driven organizations and effective transglobal leadership characteristics. We picked out 10, this is in the book, that you, you know, to give you some particular sense of how you may fall because one of the best ways to continue to develop as a leader is to continue to get insight into yourself personally. And not who you think you are or who you wish you were, but who you really are. And often, not often, we do this 72 question survey of people who are going into new environments and we will do it as a 360. So they get a full picture of feedback and they use that, you talked a lot about mentoring. We use that for a three month coaching situation where we can pick one or two things that if they worked on those one or two things, they would be not just a good transglobal leader, they would be the best trans global leader. So I think getting this insight into who you are and how you operate and what you really believe and what you really think and how other people see you in this environment is essential. Um, the other thing that I I'm just gonna highlight and I will go through, we had 28 people respond to this and I'll go through quickly some of the results which were pretty interesting and many of you tracked very well with the, uh, the the group that really were the transglobal leaders. Um, but I will tell you that sometimes you may be going into one country and then you're going into another country or you may have responsibility for countries or organizations within a particular region. You may be seen differently in Saudi Arabia than you're seen in, um, let's say Singapore. And it's important to know that. So just don't assume um, that because you're working effectively, let's say in a South African environment, that that's gonna play as effectively in another developing country um, like China, for example. You could argue it's not a developing country, but <laughs> Russia, let's pick anyone. So, don't just, you know, don't just assume, because like I said, one of the things of a great transglobal leader is that ability to be pragmatically flexible and to understand how they're being seen. So here are the 10 questions that we pulled out just for a quick survey. Um, in fact, you know, <laughs> Carrie Ann, I loved it when you said seeks out new and different assignments. You know, that's you personified. You know, you took, you said, I really want to do things that are going to be different and stretch me and I'm not going to pick out the standard ones. And by the way, I found more men in my years of experience in hiring and promoting executives, which is what I did at two Fortune 10 companies, would go for the um, projects and assignments that would make them look good or weren't that challenging where they could be sure that they were successful, then I saw women would do that. Women would take on uh, more challenging kinds of environments. So these are the Linda, questions. Linda, sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to remind, we have 15 minutes. Okay. So that you know. Well, I appreciate that. You manage your time how you'd like. And then just, so we have a few questions that we want to get to at the end. Okay. Thank you very much. And let me just go to the quickly to the results. If you just want to pull that up and you can see where, uh, where you are. I mean, you're, you're all going after the different and unique assignments. Um, you're responding. Here is sort of an interesting one. Um, you are taking disagreements and not necessarily um, dealing with that in a way that, that builds on diversity. And let's go to the next slide. Uh, 
the, the people focus, um, again, high in that area, high in the me to we area. So I think a lot of you have got a lot of strengths in that. Let's go to the next one. Um, structure emphasizes norms and informal networks. You guys spoke about that. That is critical in any kind of environment. Budgeting, this is a balancing one. Um, most trans global leaders, what they will do is they will stay within their budgets, but they will loosely interpret what they have to do. And just because somebody's told them from headquarters, wherever it is, that they have to do these kinds of things, they don't necessarily fit the budget into that. Very customer focused. Um, they will react and they will be proactive around customer needs. I think, uh, Kelly, you talked beautifully about that. So let's go to this one final slide here that we have that obviously people focused. What I want you to just take a minute to do, and I know we don't have much time and we have questions to ask, do this perhaps in, in, in a half a minute or a minute here. I've gone through the dimensions with you there on one side and the extremes are on the other side. Um, Mark yourself on a scale of one to 10, where you would put yourself quickly. Um, and then what surprised you? And then do exactly the same exercise for where you see your organization. And I'll tell you why I have people do this all the time, because very often a really great trans global leader works in an organization that does not necessarily um, embrace trans global leader perspective. So it's very important to know that there's a gap perhaps around team connectivity that you may have to work on and be sensitive to in order to be successful and have your project be successful. So let's just take one minute and then we're going to close and open it up for Q and A, what surprised you, what are you thinking about, et cetera. And I'll call time in just a minute and we'll ask people if there were surprises in what they saw in themselves and what they saw in their organization. Okay, did anybody see any gaps between themselves and the organization for which they work? Yes, okay, so uh, that, that, is that a gap that you believe uh, you'd be able to close or is it one that gets in your way of what it is that you're trying to do? So I, I, I realize uh, it gets in, in the way for sure, yeah. And um, that I think, just being aware and cognizant of that, um, I think is a very, very important fact because of what you need to realize when you're in a trans-global assignment that you know the mothership, no matter where it is, you need to interpret what's going on in that local environment to the mothership and understanding those gaps of how they operate versus how you might need to operate is really essential. And that's gonna drive your strategy for sure. So I would love to talk with you a great deal more about all of that, but um, uh, there's lots of great questions coming up here. How do you find an organization? That, that's a very good question. Um, but I'm gonna turn it back over to you, Lisa, and say thank you for letting me go through this. I'm passionate about this research. I think it's really important um, for people to be successful. And, um, you know, I'm happy to answer any questions and lots of stuff in the book if, you, <laughs> if you're interested. Thank you so much, Linda. That was fantastic. And yeah, I think it is uh, enlightening, but also of course brings up a lot of, lot of questions for us. We have, want to learn more. Um, I wanted to, actually, I'm going to just go back if you don't mind. I'm going to, I'm going to start with some of the early questions um, and we'll, I'm going to ask the speakers to answer as quickly as they can so that the most questions can be answered as possible. 
Um, I see there is one for Carrie Ann. I think that's the first question. Um, and can you talk about colorism in Jamaica and how you may have benefited from it? It's a, I'm, I'm staying true to the questions. <laughs> so, Thanks. Um, it's a so I must say one. that I must say that racism is not exactly an issue in Jamaica. In fact, this is more colorism. There is a prejudice against persons that are of darker skinned um, complexion, and you know it's while while looking at me, I'm clearly not very dark skin tone and I and I think the, the, the question also asks how did I benefit from it I also think there was prejudice against me too because I was managing a field team that were that thought I received the position because I was lighter skinned which is something that commonly mm -hmm. happens I must admit in my in my home country um and you know I, I I'm, I'm proud to say that due to fair hiring practices instituted by up to this was not the case because I was up you know brought on based on my merit and my experience and education. But uh, it, 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 I wouldn't say that my lighter skin tone gave me any advantage. At least I have not seen it. I certainly had so many challenges throughout my career and, and I highlighted quite a few just now. So um, I believe Victoria asked me that question. Victoria, I, I can't say I've benefited much. <laughs> there are so many other factors working against me then. <laughs> Thanks, Carrie Ann, for that. Uh... Very open answer. Um, there is another question, and, and, I, and it kind of reflects a similar one that came later in the in the chat box. Um, sometimes it seems that women have to meet higher standards to prove ourselves as leader. And a, and a and a and a subsequent question says that they see women taking on roles above their position or, or more work, and it doesn't seem to result in. Uh, so there's two questions. It doesn't seem to result in in a faster more promotions uh, for women than men, for example. Um, so like the first question, and I, I guess this is for everybody, what are some things that have worked for you to expand acceptance of different models for leadership that are inclusive of women's leadership styles? That might be one for Linda too. It, sounds, it seems like a, maybe an organizational question. How to expand acceptance of different models for leadership that are inclusive of women's leadership styles. You're muted, Linda. I think that goes back to the whole notion of values. And if you personally value diversity as a woman, and, and here's an interesting thing, the more women you put in uh, leadership roles, the more that if they value diversity, they will reach down and pull up more women. Um, the, the other interesting thing too, is I think part of it is reflecting on um, how you approach your job. And I, 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 Kelly, you spoke about this beautifully. A man will never ask to go to a, you know, a soccer game at one o'clock in the afternoon for his kid. He goes, you know, if he needs to get his hair cut at two, he goes, you know, he'll come back and do. And it, it's true. And I'm talking about women who are the chief legal counsel for organizations, you know, the chief marketing officer. They don't do that. And I think part of it is examining who you are as a person and saying, you know, I and, and standing up for that and also being a champion of other women. In, uh, in your organization. And I once was with, I forget who it was, but the company is in the organization is not important. And, and one was a public sector health organization. Who are the women who, uh, who you should be mentoring? Who are they and where are they? Do you even know who they are? And many people looked at me like I was asking, they, like deer in the headlight. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they really didn't know. And I think having an organizational strategy to really identify top women um, and put them in increasingly expanding career roles is very important. We did that at Hewlett Packard. We started in uh, EMEA, which is you know a tough place to really start for promoting women. And we did a talent clinic and we had all the female 
women who were engineers, which most people would say, oh, well, women engineers. And we put them on a radar screen for people to see this is the top engineering female talent. And we focused on that from a promotion perspective. And we promoted 32% of those women over a course of a year. So I think feeling like you have to go above and beyond is our feeling. You know, I'm not sure. And I'm sure I think we play into that perspective and putting organization strategies in place that identify the female leadership and move them forward and bringing them to the attention of the key decision makers, very often they're men, uh, is, is important. Thanks, Linda. Um, there was one question that was directed to Kelly. Um, it's a tough one. Some USA programs come with very weak gender mainstreaming strategies. What do you think could be done to improve? Sure. I mean, I think that a lot of times gender, um, especially gender mainstreaming strategies, get treated as sort of a check the box kind of thing. And, and people say, oh, well, I've you know, disaggregated data by women or, you know, and, and something like that. And I, I think there's a lack of appreciation of really, you know, sort of internalizing and understanding what it means to, to truly mainstream gender. I, I know, especially in the health sector, we're, um, we suffer from this almost as much as anybody else because we sort of think, oh, well, our focus is on women anyway. So, you know, therefore we've accomplished it. And I, I think it really does take um, internalizing and understanding it more and, and really thinking through some of the implications of gender norms and, and social norms. And so, you know, I think it's a work in progress. I, you know, sometimes um, people have the best intentions when they create policies, um, you know, for others to follow, but then, you know, it turns into I'm following a policy and less of, you know, something that's really inherent and internalized that you're trying to, to work on and change. Okay. Thanks so much, Kelly. Um, very quickly, we have two minutes, three minutes left. Uh, um, Carrie Ann, uh, an early question was to um, give some examples of how those with foreign education or limited international experience can leverage those experiences for future opportunities within the development sector? That's a great question. Um, very, very good question. And I always said to myself that once I get my foot through the door, they will understand that I'll be a force to be reckoned with. And that was really my stance. So when I to open an office in Jamaica, I knew I'd be able to attain it. But I really yearned for global experience. And I knew that I had my limitations, which was my foreign education, the limited international experience and, and these inherent biases. So what I did, and I'm gonna be very succinct, this was my strategy. I was willing to perform roles outside of my job description to highlight my true talents. So I know I had the knowledge, I know I had the skill sets and I know I had a lot of the potential, but a lot of the times that was done outside of my main role. So I spoke about leading the organization of the capacity building training um, or even leading the organization of an opening ceremony that showed my management and organization skills. I supported other countries within the project or even outside of the project, formally or informally. And I expressed that to my supervisor or manager. And that showed my team building skills. I asked, asked the shadow persons that had specific technical knowledge or skills that I was interested in and that showed my willingness to learn as well as my, my you know the opportunity to be more rounded um you know i also found opportunities or uh, to express myself such as in forums like these or even contribute to abstracts or research papers and that built the reputational capacity of the company so that was done outside of my job description, right? But it yeah. was ways that I promoted my visibility and I hope it may help you.